All right, welcome to the talk Advanced Mixed Reality Development and Best Practices here in beautiful Cologne. So what we're going to talk about, first I'm going to share some of the past and the present. I'm going to show you some of the apps we developed and tell the lessons we learned and hopefully you can apply some of that knowledge to your own projects. And then we will actually quickly move into the future of mixed reality, which means um, adding more AI and more intelligence to your mixed reality applications. And I'm also going to show you a demo. You will get the source code for that. I have an open source project for you there, which is running real-time object recognition on the HoloLens using deep learning inference. Lots of good buzzwords there, but it's working. And at the end, I will conclude it with my top 10 HoloLens development recommendations. And I go fast because I just have 45 minutes and I have a lot of content to squeeze in. Um, I'm Director of Global Innovation at Valorum. So we did HoloLens development since 2015. Well, we got onboarded and uh, have been doing lots of more focused enterprise development for lots of different clients. Our uh, company, Valorum, is based in the US. I actually work from Germany. I'm uh, based in Dresden, so that was easy to get here. And um, yeah, I'm also Microsoft Regional Director and MVP, which are awards that Microsoft gives out to independent experts that you know, share their knowledge. So I do you know, public speaking and blog posting and all of that, and just enjoy sharing the knowledge. Cool. So let's talk about some of the apps. I just picked three because I thought they were most interesting and also because of NDA reasons, as you can imagine. So that's an app we did uh, together with Bridgestone, where we have been uh, showcasing how you can you know, augment real-world tires with virtual content. And let me roll the video in the background while I'll explain some of the components and tell you what we learned with that. So first of all, watch the gentleman wearing a hall lens. His name is Justin as he's looking at that real-world tire, right? So this is a real tire from Bridgestone, and you see that it's being recognized, right? You see the virtual silhouette overlaid on the real-world tire. What we're using here is Vuvoria model targets, which allow us to do object tracking without having to use any fiducial marker, right? So there's no AR mark or no QR code or anything involved in it. What we have to do here, we need to take a CAT model, a 3D model of that real-world object, the tire in this case, and we need to transform that so it works with the model target. So we cannot take this full-blown multi-million polygon cat model, right? Uh, we need to reduce it to a certain size. What we found out, like 30 to 40,000 polygon works pretty well. What we also experimented with, what parts are you know, part of the 3D model? So first, we had just had the outer rim, because this is what Bridgestone produces, right? They don't produce the rims, so we just had the outer rubber piece. But it didn't track well, of course. So we added to the 3D model the inner rim. And then it tracked much better. So that's another thing. You need to try out what kind of pieces you make uh, part of your 3D model. Another interesting part is the light. You see we mounted a little light on top of it. And that helped to increase the contrast on the tire. So it tracked also much better. So you need to uh, play around with these kind of settings. Uh, the second piece, you see this, this holographic gentleman explaining about uh, those tire components, right? What we're using here is a technology we're developing called Holobeam, and I'm going to talk about it in a couple of minutes. Also, you might uh, notice that the rendering quality is quite nice, considering the HoloLens constrained mobile platform. Um, this is all done with custom shaders, right? If you don't know what a shader is, a shader is basically a little program that runs on a graphics card that, you know, that defines how your object is being lit, how it's being rendered in the end. And on the HoloLens constrained platform, you cannot take your full-blown Unity standard shader. It's just, just too heavy. So we wrote custom shaders for all of those, and that's how we got the maximum performance. Uh, what you should try out is they've definitely Unity's latest shader graph. It's a visual editing tool where you can basically create shaders just by clicking and you know, um, connecting nodes and so on. And then in the end, you still want to look into the generated shader code and optimize it, because you know, generated code is always a nice starting point, but you want to have 100% performance tuning there. So you need to look into the code. All right, here, another project uh, where we have been using a machine learning backend for object recognition. Um, so here's how the app works. The user puts on the whole lens. They look at the object. They do an air tap. And then it takes a photo, a snapshot, the one you can see in the, in the lower left panel there. And this is being sent to a backend where we have a deep neural network that was trained for object recognition. It pulls in extra data like schema graphics and so on for the disk break here in this example. And then you will basically see a lot of the 
uh, content. So the user doesn't have to do any further action, right? They don't have to open a laptop. They don't have to like click and enter stuff. It basically is using object recognition. And this, this piece allows us to have very little input needed to actually you know, bring them data right in front of them. Um, well, I'm showing that because at this was last year, we had to use a machine learning backend. And I'm going to show you a demo in a couple of minutes where you can now do these kind of object recognition tasks with a trained deep neural network on the device itself so you don't have to go and talk to uh, the cloud, if you will. Because you know, in these kind of settings, factory settings, internet connectivity is always constrained, right? It's always a challenge. So you actually want to have that on the device. Uh, here's Holobeam. I mentioned that. So that's our immersive telepresence solution we're developing, uh, where we can, like you have seen, record, pre-record uh, data, and then we can uh, play that back. Also, let me roll the video here real quick. So here you can see that's me actually beaming into the New York City store of Microsoft uh, from Dresden in real time. So that's actually the really amazing part is we cannot just record it. We can actually stream that real time over a normal internet connection with just 5 Mbit to have full HD color. So here's how we're doing it. What we do here is we're using a depth camera, like a Kinect. So we can take the depth data, right? So basically, the depth data defines the distance to each pixel. And we take the, the color data and the distance, the depth map, and stream that over WebRTC. So we, we took WebRTC, which is an open source project, but forked that because we had to include the depth data and all of it. And we came up with a custom encoding solution there that maintains the the, the stability, basically, and we don't have a lot of encoding artifacts in there, right? So we stream that over WebRTC, and on the viewing side, with the HoloLens, for example, uh, we're decoding that and rendering a point cloud in real time. So how can you achieve real-time point cloud rendering on the HoloLens? All just custom shaders, right? What we use here is a geometry shader, and the video is decoded. The video is, is decoded. Yeah, this is crazy. The video is decoded <laughs> with um, Windows Media Foundation. So it all runs on a GPU, right? The decoding of the video. And then we have a texture, which is still on a GPU, and we can directly input that into the shader so we don't have to bring it back to the CPU, right? It's all staying on a GPU, and that's the way you can uh, render these kind of real-time point clouds. Here's another video. It was featured at Sachin Nadella's keynote at Inspire two months ago, I think. So as you can see here, we don't just have holographic streaming so that each person can see each other as a hologram. But in fact, what we can also do is uh, 3D collaboration. So what you will see in a minute is um, that you know, the two guys will actually bring up a 3D model. So they, they can see each other, but they can also interact with that 3D model here, right? So he can use two-handed gestures to rotate and move it, uh, to scale it up, to interact. And both people say it synchronized in the same world space, right? In real time, without any delay. Here's another one just on Monday. We had it featured in another Microsoft keynote, which was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, you can see a different model, kind of different storytelling here, but uh, similar concept, right? 3D model collaboration. That's one of Microsoft's new buildings they're going to build at the campus. Uh, and uh, yeah, they were thinking about like, how can they improve it, what are kind of the, the considerations they need to do, right? All right, yeah. let's talk about the future. I already hinted at it. What's the future holding up for us? Well, definitely AI plays a huge role, right? Um, artificial intelligence, um, not just for mixed reality, but definitely will play a huge role for mixed reality. In fact, if you look at the HoloLens, it already has AI built in, right? But enabling that for every developer and that every developer can run um, you know, kind of deep learning inference on the device, that's where it's going, and that's pretty amazing. But let the man speak himself. That's Alex Kipman, technical fellow of Microsoft and basically the inventor of the HoloLens and the Kinect. And you, you can read what he said in a LinkedIn post there. Uh, but yeah, it's not just him. I mean, it's also Sajin Adela and other unimportant people like me that keep on saying that since a while, that this is where we're going. So just a quick primer. What kind of AI are we talking about? And again, that would be a, just a course for multiple hours explaining that. So just on a high level. Um, you have AI, right? That's the big buzzword. But there is a bunch of different um, technologies or algorithms in AI. And one of them is deep neural networks or deep learning. And that's the, 
the thing that's actually gaining most momentum and where you see most progress happening these days. And there are different ways for using deep learning. Um, most important for computer vision, for recognition on visionary tasks, is a convolutional neural network and supervised learning. So supervised learning basically means you have a training data set, so thousands or millions of images, and a desired output result for each of those, like a label, right? And then you would run that through a neural network multiple times. You check, or the algorithm would check the output, compare it with the desired output, and then would make the adjustments. So basically, it would back propagate the error through the neural network, and then adjust those, those weights here, you know, the connections. This is, this is really where the loan data is being stored, right? And these are basically floating point values, floating point arrays. Fancy term is a tensor, which is just nothing else than a multidimensional array, right? So you have a, a tensor input, you have an output, and in between you have multiple layers uh, where the, all the trained data is being stored. All right, so good news is you can uh, do this in inference. So basically, when, when I talk about training, I mean like supervised training, like I mentioned, so running all the data through the network. Once it's trained, it enters the so-called inference phase, right? Where you give it data it has not seen before, and it can infer the result. So it can predict the result. And the good news is, uh, Windows 10, in the April 2018 update, introduced a new API called Windows Machine Learning, or WinML. And that allows you to run those pre-trained neural networks locally on the device. And especially if you have a DirectX 12 device, it can run it hardware accelerated on the GPU. And further down the line, we will actually have dedicated uh, new chips, right? Accelerator chips, just for AI inference. Uh, if you look at the iPhone, for example, they have, for example, an AI accelerator chip. We will see more and more of those coming out in the next couple of years. So good news is we can take the advantage of the cloud, like uh, custom vision AI, Azure machine learning, whatever. There are also, Amazon has a bunch of offerings. So you can train it in the cloud, because this is very compute intensive. Once it's trained, you can export that as a so-called ONNX model, or Onyx, which is an, a format that WinML understands. And then you can deploy that pre-trained Onyx model as part of your app package workload and let the inference run locally on the device and get very short latency. Sweet, demo time. So what I'm going to show you is a pre-recorded video. Uh, typically, I would put on the HoloLens and stream it live. But since it's using the camera of the HoloLens, I cannot stream it live at the same time, right? So that's a bit of a challenge. But at least I can record it, which is cool. So I'm going to show you a quick demo here. Of, a, of this application, and then I'm going to show you a bit of source code, and then uh, you can also get the source code on GitHub later on. All right, so listen. This might be a car wheel 3.5 meter in front of you. So as you can see, it's showing the detected results there in a little text. This label. might be a matchstick 1.1 meter in front of you. And also, it provides you text to This speech, is likely right? a minibus 3.1 meter in front of you. And what I'm using here is a squeeze net. This is likely model. a Volkswagen Multivan Generation 6 3.2 meter in front of you. And the squeeze net neural network architecture is really a small one that runs on mobile pretty well. This is likely a car mirror 96 centimeter in front of you. And this is trained on a modified ImageNet database, which contains 1,000 different labels, right? It can detect 1,000 different labels. This objects. might be a hammer 63 centimeter in front of you. And you notice I'm also using the spatial mapping of the whole lens to measure the distance. This right? is likely a Black and Decker power drill 82 centimeter in front of you. This might be a Raid Burger beer bottle 1.2 meter in front of you. Hey, finally some proper beer in Cologne. This might be a notebook oh, 80. Yeah, I had to do that, sorry. No offense, all good. Uh, I actually had a college yesterday and it was good, so. Anyway, long story short, you see it, uh, real-time object detection. And here's the amazing part of that. So with the RS4 April 2018 update, it only supported uh, on the HoloLens GPU infer uh, CPU inference, right? Now with the RS5 update that is actually about to ship also for the HoloLens, you can even use GPU acceleration on the HoloLens because they ship a DirectX 12 driver for this free old Intel Atom processor, which is pretty stunning, if you ask me. So here's a screenshot you can see in the top with the coffee mark, CPU maxed out, inference time 760 milliseconds, right? Then I enable GPU acceleration, GPU maxed out, and 182 milliseconds 
inference. So that's quite a boost there. And again, consider it's on this mobile device, the whole lens, right? Okay, though, let's, let's dive a bit into the code. I'm going to show you the Unity project real quick and then a bit of the code. Um, who's a developer in the audience? All right, well, 50%, I would say. So don't be scared. Won't be too much code. Uh, and for the developers among us, you will get all the source code on GitHub, so you can dive a bit deeper later on. So really simplistic Unity scene here. Um, if I could find my mouse, that would be great. Huh, I don't know. Anyway, so what you can see here is the main camera that has the little status text below it, right? So I can output the status text. Um, then we have a DNN model. It's an empty game object, just an empty game object to hold some scripts. And I'm going to explain those scripts to you in a couple of seconds. So this is where all the magic is happening, if you will. And then uh, at the bottom, we also have this uh, resources folder, which is this special Unity folder where you can store data that is being deployed as part of your app package workload. And uh, here's the Onyx model, the pre-trained model. And then we have a labels.json file. So like, like I mentioned, the Onyx model has, um, it can recognize 1,000 objects, so it has 1,000 output neurons, right? And this is basically just mapping the index to the label so that we say, OK, for example, if, um, I don't know, index 25 um, you know, fires a lot uh, of the neuron, then we can map it to European fires element or whatever, right? So that's pretty much it. So let's jump into Visual Studio and show you a bit of the code. So this is the DNN model behavior. That's the main script that is running all this stuff. What I'm doing here is I'm, I wrote a class called SqueezeNet model where I call the load model async. So let's dive into that one. And in the load model async, what I'm doing here is, first of all, it's parsing the labels from the JSON file, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, then I'm getting this a resource from Unity, the Onyx model, and convert that in the Universal Windows platform stream, which you have to do quite a couple of lines. And then I'm actually loading that with this WinML method, load from stream async. So I'm loading that here. Then I'm taking that model and use that to initialize a session, a new WinML learning model session. And as you can see, I'm also passing in what kind of device it should run on. And you could say learning model device kind. Um, there's a couple, actually. So you can say DirectX, DirectX high performance, DirectX min power. Um, I tried the DirectX high performance and DirectX. They are just the same, on the whole lens at least. Uh, and then also, you could use it on the CPU, right? Another thing what I do is I parse the uh, input data. So I you know, basically analyze the Onyx model input layer. And I use that later on to actually define what the image size should be for the input, right? And then you have an output layer. So I also get the output description there. So let's jump back to the um, managing code, if you will. What we do here is. I wrote a class which uses the webcam or the RGB camera of the HoloLens using windows.media.capture. So I'm not using the Unity webcam texture here because Windows Media Capture allows me to use the resource at the same time to record a video with the mixed reality capture, right? So this is the way I could actually record the video. And then I say start capturing. And as you can see, what I input here is from my deep neural network model, the input width description and the input height description. So I pass in basically the pixel size, the frame size I want to get from my camera. And this way, I have the optimal size, and I don't waste a lot of resources. The good news is WinML will actually take care of cropping and downscaling it to the expected size of your neural network model. But since I'm requesting camera frames in real time, I can just use the smaller ones anyway and get a bit better pull off here. All righty. Um, I spin up another task, left the, leave that running in a while loop. And then, uh, yeah, you can see the processing is going on on the background thread here in the w8 frame method, uh, which is calling into our squeeze net model again. And what I do here, then I basically jump back to the UI thread because I'm on a background thread, but I, now I want to update UI elements because I, then I need to jump back to the UI thread, right? So um, I do that, a couple of string formatting here, not super uh, exciting. And then I use the text to speech. And I'm, I'm leveraging here um, a piece from the open source mixed reality toolkit, which is called text to speech. It's pretty awesome because you can hook up a Unity audio source to the text to speech, 
And internally, it uses the Windows 10 built-in speech synthesizes API. And you just give it a string and say, start speaking, and then it will output the string. So that's pretty much it. It's all what we have time here. And you can get the source code up there. At the end of my deck, I will have a, a slide with all the links throughout so you can get a snapshot of that one. Cool. So let's talk about my top 10 mixed reality development recommendations here. Well, first of all, treat the HoloLens as a mobile device, right? Especially when we think about the HoloLens. Because, well, it's de facto a mobile device, and it's pretty much free alls at this point, which means your iPhone or whatever mobile phone you have has more power these days. Um, what I mean with that, especially, it's important to consider your pixel shaders and shaders. Because uh, what we notice is the device is pretty much fill rate bound, which means if you render those objects very close to the eye of the user, a lot of pixels get filled, right? And if, you're an, if an intense pixel shader that runs for each pixel, well, then the frame rate will drop quite dramatically. And you want to keep a stable 60 frames per second frame rate, because otherwise, when the user rotates or moves a little bit, the holograms will start to jitter, right? So you want to have the optimal uh, rendering performance. It's not just on the pixel side, but it's also on the polygonal side, uh, especially when we're dealing with enterprise clients and in a professional field where you have existing CAT models that you need to bring in, right? And these are typically bazillions of polygons, which don't render in real time, of course. So you need to optimize those. You need to reduce the polygons. Uh, there are multiple solutions available. Our friends here from Unity, they had a talk yesterday about pixies. So that's a great way to do that, because um, it allows you to actually take cat data and do the tessellation based on the cat data. Uh, another solution is available from Microsoft. They acquired a company called Simplygon, which also allows you to do a model reduction automatically. Um, and of course, you can still do that manually, right? There's a bunch of ways to do that manually. We internally actually use a kind of a hybrid approach. So depending on the client, depending on budget, you always need to consider, right? What is the it's, it's always a trade-off between quality and, and price, right? So that's the thing you need to consider. Automatic reduction works pretty well, but has some downsides. Let me actually show you another one. This is Umbra. Um, that's using dynamic level of detail. So take a look at the bridge. When, you, when I look close to the bridge, it fills in the polygons uh, dynamically, right? So the initial model here for this was 40 million polygons. And uh, it also uses occlusion culling, so basically, uh, the objects that you don't see that are hidden behind those skyscrapers, they won't be submitted to the GPU, right? So those polygons won't be seen anyway, so why actually render them? Um, here, same thing, dynamic level of detail. You look close, and then it will fill in those details after a couple of seconds. As you can see, it still has some artifacts, of course, right? Um, so like I said, always the kind of trade-off. If you don't, um, if it's not possible in your project, to reduce the quality and you know, accept those kind of artifacts, there is another option available, which is called holographic remoting. What you can do here is basically you render the content not on the HoloLens, but on a, on a dedicated machine, like a, a good PC. Right? What it does is it takes the input from the HoloLens, rotation, movement, gestures, and so on, and submits that via Wi-Fi to a PC. The scene is being rendered on the PC. And then it's streamed back as a video stream for the left and right eye, right? Back to the whole lens, and that's what you see. And here's also a little demo video. So what you can see here in the background, um, or in the front, you see what I'm seeing with the whole lens. And in the back, you can see the Unity editor where the scene is actually being rendered. And what you might be able to notice is it's actually running quite well, even with dynamic content, right? Latency is pretty short here because, well, it's, uh, it's on my dedicated network. Um, so that's definitely an option. Of course, again, keep in mind there will be latency involved, so you don't want to play like huge animations or, or stuff like that. But definitely a solution if you have like architectural static models which are just too huge to reduce. Um, it's a good opportunity. Good news is with Unity 2018 or one, you can actually now use um, output that as a universal Windows platform application. So you don't have to run the remoting rendering piece in the Unity editor, which is not so great if you want to give it to a client, because you would have to run the Unity editor, right? Now with 2018, uh, Unity 2018, you can actually export that as a UWP app. So take a look here on the bottom right. I'm just opening UWP app, right? 
And you see it, it's also doing the remoting. And another, another benefit of that, the latency is even better. So latency is even shorter, as you notice. It's basically instantly. So pretty good stuff there. Design in 3D for the holographic frame. So, well, Unity is typical UI is still 2D, right? So there's lots of 2D UI involved. But in fact, uh, we are wearing stereoscopic devices with 3D rendering. And we're living in a 3D world. So why don't we just develop 3D UI, right? So for Holobeam, for example, we're developing the UI totally from scratch. It's all 3D. And that's much nicer as an experience. There's also some good stuff uh, Leap Motion does. Uh, Leap Motion has some really um, talented UX designers and folks that are exploring a lot of amazing stuff, how you can interact with 3D UI elements. There are some really good stuff out there. And well, we're at the frontier, right? It's like we're changing how people will interact with those kind of devices and computers. And that's definitely an opportunity for us. Holographic frame. Some call that the field of view of the HoloLens. And as we all know, it's not your full face, right? So it's this window into your virtual world. And you need to consider to optimize for that. Uh, here's a little example. Uh, what we do here is, so you can see the user is being allowed to place that 3D model at a certain distance. But we don't allow them to place it too close. Because if they would put it too close, it would render to a, to a big. And it would be cut off at the top or the bottom, right? So this way, we enforce that they put it a bit further out so that it's like in the full frame, right, when, when they see it initially. Well, and since the whole lens is untethered, they can just walk close, right? They can just look at it. And then they won't, they won't actually notice that it's being cut off at the top or the bottom because they're actively engaging with it. So design for the holographic frame. Make sure that your content fits into it, at least initially. And then they can always, like, we have some interactions. Um, Move and get the details if you want, right? Uh, let your apps live in the real world. Avoid the so-called AR sticker effect. So basically, you don't have an AR element, a virtual element, floating in front of your space, right? Uh, these devices, HoloLens, Magic Leap, and whatnot, they have all amazing sensors built in. They can sense the real world. They do spatial mapping. So basically, what you can do is like place the hologram, the virtual object, on the table, right? Or let it anchor with the real world, if you will. Another way of doing that is what I've shown you with the model targets. You could also use AR codes, you know, fiducial markers. And model targets is, of course, the, the high-end version of that, if you will. And that's amazing. I mean, that's truly a mixed reality, right? It's like augmenting real object with virtual content and adding value there. So let your apps live in the real world. Let your apps stay focused and anchored. What I mean here, there is um, a technique in the HoloLens runtime which is called the stabilization plane. So what they have is basically a plane that is at a certain distance, a 3D plane consisting of a point and a normal, right? And this, the objects, the 3D objects that intersect with that plane will be the most stable ones. So you want to have your 3D objects or holograms intersect with that plane, right? The good news is with Unity 2018, uh, actually, 2017 already, and the RS4 update, they, there is a mode you can enable, which is called the depth buffer sharing. And what it, do, what it does is it basically reads out the depth buffer of your rendered frame, and then it will set the stabilization plane automatically at the closest object, right? But you still have the manual API called set focus point, where you can manually set the focus point. For example, you don't want to have the closest object being in a stabilized, but rather one that's full out. So definitely something to consider. Here's another little video. What you can see here is uh, basically you, how you can debug the stabilization plane. Um, the larger frame is a screen, a screen recording of my PC, where I have the Windows 10 device portal of the HoloLens open. And on the bottom right, you can see what I'm seeing with the HoloLens. So take a look. Um, I go to my PC, the device portal. You can enable show stabilization plane. And then it would show you this red stabilization plane in the device portal's 3D view. So take a look. If I look at the dock, right, the stabilization plane will snap. And it will stay there, even if I move slightly. right? So it will make sure this object will stay stable, even if I move a little bit. Um, yep, so that's pretty, uh, um, pretty good. And you can you know, debug it via this way. Another interesting one is the world anchor. Um, probably a few of you are familiar with it, but just for the sake that where everyone is on the same page, the world anchor basically assigns a coordinate system, or you can assign a coordinate system to a 3D object. 
And what this will do is it will make sure that this 3D object will stay at the real position relative to the real world. Right? So even if you leave the room or hide the sensor so it loses tracking the device, and then you come back in, it captures up with the tracking, it will adjust for the drift, and your virtual object will be at the same position relative to the real world where you put it before. So that's a really important one to consider. The good news is you can also um, persist those. So you can store them and save them. Um, so show spatial anchors. So you can see on the left and the right, I can also debug the spatial anchors there. So there's a little gizmo where you can see where the anchor is being put. So definitely good tools there to help you, you know, figure out what's going on, because you don't see those typically. Yeah, share your holograms with the real world, uh, with, with the world, with your customers as well. Um, there's a Windows store for the mixed reality. So you can just submit your applications. We do that a lot for marketing purposes, right? public apps. But we also do that uh, to submit and deploy applications to interested clients. So definitely a good thing to do. Um, and you can recall the mixed reality capture, the one I've shown earlier in my video. Here I see another one. And the MRC has uh, three downsides. First of all, it just uses the RGB camera of the HoloLens. Not a great quality. It drops the frame rate to 40, 40 frames per second because it needs to do real-time video encoding on the device, right? And then also the blending is not exactly what you would see with the HoloLens. So there's a better solution called Spectator View, and we built our own version called Miro, where we can just use the HoloLens or a different tracking device and use a real good DSLR camera for actually getting the, the video frame, right? And then computing is done on the PC, and we compose all of that on the PC, and you get much better quality for those kind of videos. Uh, leverage tribal knowledge. Lots of smart people out there. Here's also a little video. Again, link will be at the end on my last slide. Uh, you can go to the Unity forums. Uh, sorry, to the HoloLens forums here. Lots of smart people available. Um, lots of export actually in the Slack channel. So the Slack channel is really amazing. There's all the, the smart folks out there. Mixed Reality Toolkit. Great open source project. Provides you lots of samples scripts, shaders to get you going and get started. It's mainly driven by Microsoft, but actually the community is very much involved. In fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Stephen Hodgson, as you can see here, he is the main contributor of it. And they are heavily working on the MRTK v2, which is about to hit pretty soon. So yeah, take a look. Bunch of resources. Think outside of the box. So the HoloLens has all these amazing sensors, right? But outside of the HoloLens. We live in this world where we have so many sensors available around us, right? So think about it, like, you know, connect it with some stuff. Here's another example where we're using the Kinect. Uh, take a look at the top left. There is a Kinect that's tracking Justin there. And then we're, what we're doing here is we're synchronizing the Kinect coordinate space with the one of the HoloLens, so then we can do some kind of overlays, right? And the HoloLens or well, the mixed reality in general supports the full universal Windows platform networking APIs. So you can use streaming sockets. You can pump data really fast. And uh, there's lots of, lots of goodies available. So think outside of the box. Think what external sensor data you can connect. Uh, especially with RS4 and RS5, they also have Bluetooth LE enabled. So you can also use a lot of those Bluetooth accessories. Uh, built for the whole mixed reality platform, right? Um, here's a little demo video of it. So uh, that's actually from Dong Yong Park, um, MRTK developer. So what he's doing here is using two-handed gestures in the HoloLens, right? And then he has the same input system, and he can use it on the immersive mixed reality headset, which other people might call VR headset, right? You see, using the same kind of input modality also on the motion controllers with a VR headset with the immersive Windows mixed reality headset. <laughs> So they share the same platform. Of course, it's a different user experience. So you want to enable some kind of dynamic content, render a skybox in the virtual world when you're fully immersed, right? Uh, learn about deep learning. That's my, my top one, definitely, not just for mixed reality, but make yourself familiar with these kind of concepts, right? It's not about like becoming the data science expert or an academic researcher, but what you need to consider is, uh, well, these things become more and more important. They will change how software is developed next couple of years. So you want to understand at least how do I need to interpret the input data or the output data right, of a, of a neural network? What is a convolutional neural network doing? And these kind of things, that's what you definitely need to uh, sit down a little and, and learn about it if you don't know it. Um, for the resources, my blog, I have a Twitter handle. I will share all of that there. Um, some demo code on GitHub, the one I've shown here. 
Another example of custom vision AI and an Onyx WinML model. A couple of my previous talks, which are more introduction to uh, MR and HoloLens. And uh, the raw deep learning one, these are really good. Um, this guy made some really good YouTube videos, 30 minutes explaining deep neural networks, convolutional ne networks amazingly well in a visual way. It's really good. And even better is actually this TCRAF uh, deep learning crash course that just was released a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's a bit long. It's three hours. Uh, but this gentleman explains deep learning and all the concepts without any math or code. So that's really a good one you definitely want to consider. And with that, we're right at the end here. I thank, thank you a lot for your time. I hope it was valuable. And I will stay around for a little bit. If you have any questions, just ask me. I don't know if you have a minute or so for taking a question. Yes, but indeed. We have time for some questions. But first of all, thanks a lot for these insights you shared with us. Um, so indeed, we have uh, a minute or two for questions. So if you have questions, uh, just raise your hand, and my colleague will come to you with a microphone. There's a question in the front. Yeah, Rene, more a question about the future and look into the future for augmented reality, mixed reality. Um, do you think that the cloud processing will be a bigger topic and will become standard? So is this something we should concentrate on? Uh, I think the cloud will play a big role, definitely. And uh, I mean, we have to see what's happening. But for example, the stuff I mentioned with the holographic remoting and rendering an off device, there's also a possible way, to, for example, to use Azure GPU rendering, right? So you have those big and fancy, uh, like they have like four super expensive NVIDIA GPUs, and they can render like huge models, right? If you have a good network connection, short latency, that's definitely an option, right? For offloading a lot of the computing to the cloud. But when it comes to deep learning, I think it's like the, using best of both worlds, right? Uh, saying like you can use training on the cloud, maximizing the large computing power there, and then you can take that, export it for on the edge, like it's said these days, right? Intelligent edge, bringing that pre-trained model um, to the to the uh, on the edge, and then using that there. Does it answer the question? If not, just find me. Yeah, it does. But, uh, Thank you. Go ahead, man. Are there more questions in the audience? Just raise your hand. Yeah. Yes, one in the front. Is that what Hi. Do you have any, uh, any perspective on the next model of the HoloLens? Uh, no. No. Okay. Yeah, short, short answer. I, I cannot talk about that. I wish I would know much more. Yeah, all, like a lot of people think like, oh, yeah, this guy, he needs to know, right? But like, this is the most secretive team at Microsoft I've ever noticed. Like, these guys are insane. For good reason. So more questions in the audience. Uh, maybe what I could not quite understand yet is because um, what's the main purpose with you playing around with the HoloLens? Are you actually then uh, putting cases out there for clients, or is it more like creating Sorry. awareness of what's possible as such, uh, Valorem? So, so uh, yeah, as a company, what we do is we actually develop um, custom applications for clients. And uh, yeah, we did a, quite a couple, like a few dozen, I would say, for different industries, like healthcare, or, you know, manufacturing is very strong. Um, yeah, all different cases, retail and so on. So we do custom app development, basically. And what my focus shifted a little bit, so I, you know, the, the immersive team is now managed by like my, one of my previous um, reports. And I'm focusing now on the Hollowbeam and the innovation, innovative stuff. So we are developing it into a product. And that's my main focus at the moment. All right, well then, I think um, we're done. Thanks a lot, René. Thank you.